Hello YouTube, Bane666 here. So this is part two. I highly recommend you go and watch part one if you haven't watched it already. That way part two is going to make a lot more sense. But anyway, let's get stuck into the video. Recently, Ashley Banfield, who is one of the hosts on HLN, spoke about a story regarding Aziz Ansari. It was a story that was published in Babe magazine that accounted uh, that had the account of uh, a young woman who went on a date with him and felt uncomfortable with his advances during the date after the woman verbally indicated she did not want to have sex with him, he stopped and the date ended. Now, Ashley Banfield commented on that account because of the fact that it was being lumped in with the Me Too movement. Cases of sexual assault, cases of rape, cases of sexual harassment that ended women's careers and she wasn't in favor of the way it was covered. So she not only criticized the way it was handled by the woman making the accusations, who by the way, till this day is anonymous, they used a pseudonym rather than her real name, but she also criticized Katie Way, who was the, the writer for Babe, who made this story public. Now, uh, apparently Katie Way did not like Ashley Banfield's commentary on this and sent an email to HLN that Ashley Banfield shared with her audience. And I want to toss to the video to show you exactly uh, what that email said. Yeah, wait until you see this. This is really, really interesting, folks. And I want to share this um, because I think this gives us an insight into the caliber of the person who held that nuclear weapon uh, that was wielded on Ansari's career. The caliber of this 22-year-old young woman. And I'm only going to read a slight part of her comments to me. And I assume she fashions herself a feminist in this movement. Uh, Ashley, someone who I'm certain no one under the age of 45 has ever heard of. I hope the 500 retweets on the single news write-up made that burgundy lipstick, bad highlights, second wave feminist has been really relevant for a little while. That's from Katie Way, who was on CBS this morning. Okay, so... Uh... So, so hold on a second, hold on. Uh, that means a feminist, not only a feminist, but a feminist journalist has uh, has used insults and ad homes in uh, instead of arguments well that's uh, that's astounding that is um, absolutely amazing I never saw that coming who <laughs> would have thought that a feminist journalist would be using ad homs instead of uh, actual arguments uh, Katie Way also wanted to make public uh, the entirety of her email because she felt like that was taken out of context. I highly recommend you guys read the entirety of her email. Uh, Business Insider posted it. And throughout the entire uh, email, yes, she does say the things that were you know, relayed to you right now. Um, but she also talks about how Grace was in a vulnerable position and how dare you attack her. Uh, you disgust me. Read the whole thing. I, I don't think that it makes... The case better for Katie Way. I actually think it makes it a little worse for her. But remember, Grace still remains anonymous. We don't know who she is, and she is maybe being attacked by some people on TV or online, but no one knows who she is personally. So, okay. So, a number of things here. Number one, uh, Katie Way picked the wrong target because uh, if you're a journalist, do some research. <laughs> Oh, that is so, so funny coming from the Young Turks. I mean, their idea of journalism is reading a BuzzFeed article and then ranting about it without checking any of the sources, without checking to see if any of the so-called facts in the BuzzFeed article are actually accurate or true. Uh, and I've, I've pulled them up on this numerous fucking times before. Where they haven't checked sources, they haven't checked citations, they've just taken an article on BuzzFeed or HuffPo or where, wherever at its word. And, um, yeah. So it's it's ironic that Jig would say uh, that journalists should be doing research uh, because the Young Turks don't do any. But then again, then again, to be fair, look, I have to be fair to Jenk. Uh, the Young Turks aren't really journalists, are they? So, so I guess uh, I guess they don't really need to do research. 
Uh, Ashley Banfield is actually one of the best uh, anchors on television. And if you don't know about her, you should. And a lot of people under the age of 45 know about her because of uh, some of the coverage on the internet, including us. Uh, she was one of the few brave people on air, and she was a rising star at the time. And MSNBC had paid a lot of money to, to get her from the other networks. One of the few brave people before the Iraq war, they gave a speech saying that we shouldn't go to war in Iraq. And for that bravery, she was punished by the corporate media. MSNBC not only took her off the air, but they wouldn't let her out of her contract because they didn't want anyone speaking against the war anywhere on TV. At the time, they were owned by GE, which was a defense contractor. That's how they made most of their money. And not only that, just to teach everybody a lesson, they moved Ashley Banfield's office from an actual office to inside a closet. And she suffered through all that, and she came back, and she made it back on air. And when she was on air at CNN, she did some of the toughest interviews during the 2012 elections. Mm -hmm. So she's actually a great journalist. But you didn't bother researching that, you just judged her for her lipstick and her hair and her age, which I'm pretty sure is not the progressive way of handling things. Ah, oh, Jenk, that is exactly the progressive way of handling things. Uh, just ask any MRA. We get this shit all the time. We get called white supremacists and Nazis and misogynists and apparently we all live in our mother's basements and we've never had girlfriends and we we hate women and uh oh we're, we're losers in every single way and we're angry because we're losers and we can't get laid you you know the same shit we get all the time from journalists although you know really people who rely on those types of arguments shouldn't really be called journalists should they so the comments on Ashley Banfield's appearance is the exact reason why I did want to do this follow-up. Um, because I think it would be totally fair to maybe respond to Ashley Banfield based on the merits of her argument. Maybe you want to criticize uh, the open letter that she put out there uh, toward Grace, who was the woman that you wrote about. That, that is completely fine. But you immediately went to attacking her age, attacking her physical appearance, attacking her lipstick, her highlights. That is a really weird position to take or a weird attack to make considering the fact that you pride yourself on being this self-righteous feminist who wants to provide a voice for someone like Grace. No, actually, that's, uh, that's not weird at all. These types of journalists tend to be very young, very self-righteous. They think they know everything. They really don't have a lot of uh, critical thinking skills. So they rely on arguments they've heard from the echo chamber and they just regurgitate them. And when they, they're not using them, they usually rely on insults and ad homs and personal attacks. Uh, this is something I've criticized these particular type of feminist journalists for on a regular basis. They, they will try to attack the person and not the argument. It's a tactic they do all the fucking time. It's nothing new, it's nothing surprising. The only difference is it's towards a more experienced feminist journalist, someone I can actually have respect for, because it sounds like she's an actual journalist. She doesn't LARP as a journalist like a lot of these so-called journalists do. But it's the same shit. We're talking about immature morons who are given jobs as journalists. Who, by her own admission, didn't make it clear that she didn't want to have a sexual relationship with Ansari at that moment until she finally said no and he completely stopped. Now, I want Ashley Banfield to respond to her as well. I want you to hear it. it's very short. Take a look. If you truly believe in the Me Too movement, if you truly believe in women's rights, if you truly believe in feminism, the last thing you should do is attack someone in an ad hominem way for her age. I'm 50. And for my highlights, I was brown haired for a while when I was a war correspondent interviewing Yasser Arafat and in Afghanistan and Iraq, Gaza and the West Bank. Google those places. That is not the way we have this conversation as women or men. We don't attack as journalists. Let's be frank. Right. We do not attack people for their age or their highlights or their lipstick because it is the most hypocritical thing mm. a woman who says she supports the women's movement could ever do. 
Now, I don't know a lot about Ashley Banfield, but it it's clear that she's an actual journalist. She actually goes places and in some instances probably puts her life in danger and actually interviews people. Now, I, I don't know if I'd agree with all of her politics, but I can respect her for being an actual journalist, unlike the person who wrote the, the article on Aziz. That type of journalist, I, I have this image in my head that they wake up in the morning, they make themselves a coffee, they grab their laptop, and then they go sit on the toilet for an hour. And while drinking their coffee, they squeeze out a turd. Now, the only question is, am I talking about the article they're writing or or them taking a shit? I, I guess there's not much difference, is there? Wow. Yes. I, um, I appreciate that saltiness to no <laughs> end. I really do. Okay, look, as far as the overall story, whether it was Ashley Banfield or our coverage, um, and let's talk about our coverage for a second. I think that there are legitimate uh, critiques that you can make, and I think that that's Katie Way could have gone in that direction. Absolutely. Right? So, so a lot of people have pointed out, hey, look, you we, you should have emphasized for us, you should have emphasized more of the parts where uh, Aziz Ansari kept insisting and persisting and and uh, made numerous attempts to hook up, and they did hook up in different ways, and then eventually he said no, right? And so I, I've seen. Uh, whether you want to call them feminists, progressives, etc., make those claims, and I think those are legitimate claims. We can disagree on a lot of it, but it's fair to point out. Okay, there's also the illegitimate criticism: a bunch of the right wing pretending to care about this issue, mm -hmm. and they they say, "Oh yeah, you guys only care about it because uh, Aziz Ansari is Muslim." Now, uh, I did get a lot of comments in my part one, which suggested that yeah, the Young Turks are only sticking up for Aziz because he's he's Muslim and he's brown skin and he's left wing. And uh, look, I, I don't know if that is true, but let me just say I don't think it hurt. I honestly don't think it hurts that he's brown skin, Muslim and a progressive. Now, would the Young Turks defend a white conservative Trump voter in exactly the same way? I, I look I can't say for sure but I can't imagine they would and this is because they make everything about race they're constantly talking about race so it's not surprising that people would come to the conclusion that maybe they're a little bit biased might maybe a little bit biased against whites and maybe a little bit biased in the favor of non-whites and the same can be said about politics. So I, I think it's a fair question to ask. Are they only doing this or are they more likely to do this? That's probably a fairer question. Are they more likely to do this for someone who is brown skin, Muslim and progressive than say someone who's white, conservative and a, a Trump voter? Or what about if this was Trump? Would they be defending Trump the same way, I wonder? It's an interesting question. What? What? I didn't even, what? I gotta be honest, I didn't even know he was Muslim. Yeah, what does that have anything to do with this? But <laughs> they see things only in terms of groups. Yeah. So they're like, oh, Aziz Asar is Muslim, so therefore I hate him, therefore I believe the well, story. Well, you know, I... Uh, uh, no, Jenk, no, it's not that people hate him because he's Muslim and therefore believe the story. No, they're, they're saying that you're more likely to believe the story because of the color of his skin and his religion and his politics. You're more likely to be sympathetic. That doesn't mean that those people believe he's guilty. They're just accusing you of having different standards for different people. I mean, we're very consistent. Like anytime a liberal gets accused, we go ahead and support him, right? Anytime anyone we agree with gets you know, accused, we go ahead. I mean, come on, whatever. I, I don't care about that criticism at all, at all. For legitimate critiques, I hear you, right? And, and the persistence was definitely evident in, in Grace's account. But here's the thing, you, she didn't make it clear that she wasn't into it. At times she complied, at times she claimed she mumbled something under her breath. It's at one point he suggested that she suck his dick and, uh, and she did. Which I don't know about you, but that that usually is an indicator that the person is into it. That once again, let me stress, 
he didn't force her, he didn't pressure her, he asked her, and she did it. Isn't that what we're constantly being told by feminists, that you have to ask these things? It's just not clear communication. And, and to put it all on, on sorry and make it seem as though he's like some crazy predator that we all need to look out for, I just think that it unfortunately could destroy someone's career when you don't clearly state that you're not interested in having a sexual relationship with that person. Yes, Anna, um, anonymous allegations, anonymous false allegations can actually destroy someone's career and destroy their lives. Uh, this is something that MRAs have been talking about for a very, very long time. And it's something we've got a lot of criticism over from feminists. In fact, I believe you guys criticized this last year over the whole Title IX thing. Men's rights movement, I I'm a man, <laughs> right? So why would I be against men's rights? Because I'm not against men's rights, nobody is. Men already have a lot of rights. <laughs> So, see, the way that it worked was we had all the rights in the beginning, and then eventually um, it spread out to more and more people. In fact, it was, of course, as you know, propertyed white men and then non propertyed white men, and, and the list goes on and on of the people who got rights. So, it's not like men needed someone to protect them because, oh my gosh, they have been you know, discriminated against for such a long time. Now, if the pendulum swung too far, and you could show a couple of cases here in this divorce proceeding, you see how it is no longer equal. Okay, that's a good conversation to have, and I've had that conversation. And as it turns out, men's rights groups don't really stop there. The more you get in the weeds, the uglier it gets. And talking about how women had this coming and that coming, and they've been taking away our rights forever. Taking away your rights? No, no, you have to show very specific examples. Otherwise, you're the ones who started with all the rights in the first place, and that includes me. Just read history, any history, but uh, obviously some people are not enamored with facts. So now our uh, education uh, secretary is like, oh yes, 50-50, I meet with people who suffered rape and sexual assault and the people who care about them, and I meet with people who think that that is a made up issue and that they kind of had it coming a little bit sometimes in some assault cases. Made donations totaling $25,000 to foundations for individual rights and education which has shared articles dismissive of sexual assault survivors. One read, unfortunately, much of the feminist war on rape has conflated sexual assault with muddled, often alcohol-fueled sexual encounters that involve miscommunication. You call it rape, I call it miscommunication. They gave money to that cause. So now are you surprised that Betsy DeVos is meeting with people who are for men's rights to protect men from the miscommunication that happens when they're in what what they admit are alcohol fueled sexual encounters but uh, obviously some people are not enamored with facts and he wasn't the only one in the room you you could have you know so we i don't want to wade too much back into it but to, to, it makes it seem like ansari is the only person with uh, cognitive ability there who could actually act and you know right what? and that's crazy and if you're a feminist of course you shouldn't believe that look yes uh, feminism should be treating women as adults unfortunately they don't feminism doesn't it it treats women as if they're little children a man can be blind drunk and apparently he can still give consent but a woman can have a few glasses of alcohol and suddenly she can't consent to anything even if she is the aggressor. I know we've got legitimate disagreements about the story, but you know. Here's what I'm not okay with though. Uh, I'm not okay with anyone trying to shut me down because they don't agree with my opinion, okay? I wanna have a dialogue, I wanna have a conversation, and I wanna do so in a civil way where people aren't attacking one another based on stupid things like physical appearance or whatever. If you wanna have a dialogue and a conversation like an adult, I hear you and I wanna hear those critiques. Well, if that's true, then you have my respect, Anna. Um, forgive me for being a little bit suspicious, though, that maybe that's not 100% the case. And hopefully you're being honest. And uh, if that is the case, then I have to give you a lot more credit than a lot of your fellow feminist journalists who, when you ask them simple questions, when you ask for more information or for them to back up their claims, uh, they tend to block you. 
they're definitely not interested in a dialogue. That's for sure. But if you're not interested in that and you want to shut people down the second they say something that makes you uncomfortable, I'm not interested in you. If you're offended by that, if you're offended by opinions and dialogue, then this is not the program for you. Yeah, I don't think most of the critics of the Young Turks, including myself, are offended by opinions. I, I think what we're offended by is uninformed opinions. And as I've said numerous times, the Young Turks have a habit of reading an article online and taking it at its word without doing any research, without checking citations, without checking the facts. And I'm, I'm using facts in talking marks there without checking the facts in the article to see if they're accurate, and then they'll rant and rave for 10-15 minutes about it. That's not journalism. A proper journalist would check sources, would check citations, would see if the article is, in fact, accurate. That's what we criticize you about. All right, and last thing, uh, in the rest of the letter, you're right, Anna, she doesn't do herself any favors. I had no opinion on the writer before, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but. After uh, insulting Ashley Banfield's career and, and appearance, etc., and she says, uh, I will remember this for the rest of my career. I'm 22 and so far not too shabby. Yeah, so in other words, we have just uh, another example of an arrogant little shit who thinks that she's a journalist. Writing clickbaity fucking crap for some online online publication that no one had ever heard of before this whole thing broke. Now, I could go into a long explanation about this type of person, but uh, just recently I saw a video with Rose McGowan, and, and I think that sums up this type of person perfectly. So I'm just going to play a clip here. I just can't, I don't, I can't. Look, I, I was 22 once, and I know what it's like to be 22 and, and think that you are on top of the world and you know everything, and then life rains down on you and it humbles you. It's like, it's a common thing. Um, there was, but it was Trumpian, the way she capitalized, she disgusts me, the way that she puts the exclamation point on not too shabby. But Katie, so Ashley Banfield took courageous stands against a war that killed millions of people. And you wrote this piece that you're now so proud of, and you think that makes your career better than hers at the age of 22 because of this piece. But then it makes me think that might be part of the reason you wrote the piece. Ah, uh, look at that. I think Jenk just hit the nail right on the head. Because, hey, look at my great career. You didn't do yourself any favors with this letter. So I just want to finish this video with a little story, which is kind of me to relate it uh, in a way. You'll see what I mean as you listen to the story. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find the video clips for this. I would have loved to have shown them to you. And trust me, I did search, but could not find them anywhere. So you're just going to have to go by my description from memory. And I know that's not perfect, but... Uh, I think you'll get the meaning anyway. So about 10 years ago, there was a TV program here in Australia called The Chopping Block. And the premise of this show was that two restaurants which were struggling would compete each week. Top chef and restaurant owner Matt Moran would go to each restaurant. He'd have a meal and he'd check out the quality of the food. He'd see the wait staff. He'd look at the decor and the atmosphere of the restaurant and then the next day he would go behind the scenes into the kitchen he'd check how they store the food how they prepare the food 
he'd look at the menu and he'd talk to the chef and the owners and the wait staff. He'd go through the restaurant top to bottom. And then each restaurant would get his recommendation. And I think it was something like $5,000 and two weeks to do any renovations or changes that they might want to uh, to do based on his recommendations. Now, it's amazing how many of the owners refused to uh, to make any changes, even though he is the top chef in Australia who's owned many, many restaurants and their restaurants are failing. You know, they would still, in a lot of cases, stick to their guns and ignore his recommendations and just continue down the road to ruin. But anyway, after the two-week period, he'd go back and check them out again, and then the winner got some prize money. I'm, I'm not sure how much. But the reason why I bring all this up is because of one particular episode which has stuck in my mind since then, and you'll understand why in a minute. I think it's the only episode that I remember. To be more exact, one restaurant uh, in one episode, because I, I can't even remember who they were competing against, but this one thing has stuck in my mind for the last 10 years. Now from memory it was a Melbourne restaurant and I think it was an Italian restaurant and it was family owned and the daughter who was in her late 20s I think going for memory was hostess so she would see people to their tables and she would check in on them during the night to make sure that everything was okay and they were having a good experience. Yeah, this young woman was, um, let's say, a little bit on the large side and rather busty. And she had this weird habit of randomly grabbing a male customer by the back of the head and shoving his face into her cleavage and then rubbing her cleavage against his face. She would just, like, randomly do this to male customers. I'm not joking, by the way. (laughs) I'm... I'm 100% serious. You can see why this one restaurant out of this one episode has stuck in my mind for 10 years. Now, I'm sure there are lots of guys out there who didn't mind this, uh, but I'm sure there are some who did. Maybe someone's of a particular religious faith and they would find such a thing really offensive. Maybe they're in a relationship and they would find such a thing really offensive. And I have to wonder how many of these guys got raked over the coals by their wives and girlfriends when they got home, even though it wasn't their fault. It's not like they asked for it. Maybe they're gay, or maybe they're asexual, or maybe they're just not into fat Italian chicks. Who knows? But there's lots of reasons why some men may have found that offensive. And one of the the men who found it offensive was Matt Moran who was there in a professional capacity. He was there on business, right? This is his job. He's the the host and judge of this TV show, and he was there to see how the restaurant functioned. And he was just horrified when she grabbed his head and basically shoved his face into her tits and started rubbing her tits against his face. He just had this shocked look on his face, like, what the fuck? And then the next day, he had to explain to her why this was inappropriate in a restaurant. And he did so calmly, but firmly. And of course, she burst into tears and played the victim. She couldn't understand why anyone would find that offensive. Or why it was inappropriate to do that to random people at a restaurant. And come to think of it, I seem to remember another story which was in the media a a little while ago about a, I think it was a Scottish restaurant where the waiters wore kilts and apparently they were constantly getting groped by drunk women who didn't seem to have any issue with just grabbing a random man up his kilt. Once again, maybe there are some men into this, but it's quite possible a lot of them weren't. Maybe they didn't find the women attractive. Maybe they're in a relationship. Maybe they're religious. Maybe they're gay. Lots of reasons why someone working as wait staff would not want a drunk random woman reaching up his kilt and trying to grab his cock. Now, the reason why I bring these things up is because we never hear this side. This particular thing is left out of the Me Too situation. And clearly I'm not saying that these instances are rape, but clearly they're inappropriate. 
And I'm sure if there was a male waiter in Melbourne who was randomly grabbing female customers by the back of their head and shoving their face in his groin or in his in his chest or, or whatever, uh, I, I'm sure there would be outrage. And I'm sure Clementine Ford would have written dozens of articles by now claiming that this is why we live in a rape culture. So I just wanted to point that out as an interesting double standard.